Well, it's been 10 years since the global financial crisis. It began in early 2007 with global lender HSBC announcing that it was going to write down a $2 billion loss for subprime mortgage loans in the U.S. And the U.S. investment bank Bear Stearns became the first major collapse and was later bought by J.P. Morgan in March of 2008. That September, the U.S. government bailed out Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, mortgage companies that had guaranteed thousands of toxic mortgages. Shortly afterwards, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy, which set off a global financial panic. Well, by October, Dow Jones was having its worst week ever. And eight central banks, including the Bank of England, the European Central Bank, and the Federal Reserve, cut their interest rates in tandem to ease pressure on borrowers. Well, of course, the financial crisis didn't just hit the U.S. In particular, it also hit institutions in Europe, including in Iceland, the U.K., Ireland, Spain, and Greece. And that forced many governments to take a hard look at how their corporations and markets functioned. Well, joining me to discuss what's changed in the past 10 years is global business executive Ryan Patel. Ryan joins us from Los Angeles. Welcome. Thanks for having me. So looking at how devastating the global financial crisis was for so many countries, how have financial markets changed in the past 10 years? Well, I mean, the first thing, obviously, is is the regulation on the banks, specifically. But to get out of that, you mentioned it. They all kind of came together from the other banks, the interest rates decreasing, to be able to get the economy back. But these kind of controls for these regulations really helped a, a stronger balance sheet for these other companies. So when you're taking less riskier investments out of the equation, you're scaling back some of this growth and really focusing on the actual company, bank, institutions, will then next provide a healthier balance sheet for people to actually continue to grow. So what improvements have been made to avoid another crisis and what still needs to be done? Well, one of the things that I, you see, there's a lot more controls in place, for sure, when it comes to risk, um, internal co co controls that is what I mean, from finances to uh, reassurances to even risk assessments. But the next thing is cybersecurity and also what needs to take place now is in this investment um, in, in what, I, what I believe is the next kind of big thing for the line controls is not to kind of go away from this Dodd-Frank Act, but more importantly, focus on um, what is upcoming and staying true to who you are. Now, being the momentum that we're seeing with lawmakers, what are the pros and cons that could come with the proposed changes in Dodd-Frank? Well, right now, it is definitely a bank lobbyist dream uh, to kind of get this to, to deregulate. And we don't know, like you said, what the actual end goal, the end bill will be. But I'd be very careful um, on to see how much control you're giving up. Because obviously, the small banks get a benefit in this. But you know, American Express and some of these other bigger institutions that are in there, they get some uh, lacks to be able to flow through a lot of capital without being kind of oversaw with regulation. And how do you see these changes potentially impacting global financial markets? Well, listen, when we got into trouble, everybody had to come together to, uh, to kind of help stop this recession or get it back to the next place. So to me, that's, that's an easy question that it will affect, uh, especially when you start, it's kind of a domino effect. When you kind of lend one place and there's become riskier assets, it becomes unpredictability, and that causes kind of this tenure strain in the market as well. So with this deregulation that we're seeing with the Trump administration, to what degree does that make global markets then more susceptible to some of these wild swings that we've seen? Well, if it's key, it's unpredictability, as you've seen in the last probably year. Whenever the market sees that someone says one thing and it doesn't really turn out to be the way it's supposed to be, they react you know, really to the opposite to extreme. And that is what this is going to cause, because we really don't know if if what kind of bill is going to get passed, and that itself, and then the actual repercussions to it will also provide a lot of guesswork in this. So the traders are just going to keep guessing until they actually know what it is. And speaking of repercussions, we know that China was one of the few countries to escape the global financial crisis, experiencing a mild slowdown in economic growth. What do you attribute that to, and what sort of policy response did we see? Well, I mean, obviously they're at the 6% now in their GDP, and that's still pretty high, but yeah, that for them, they've slowed down. I think the, one of the things is their debt, right? You know, you see global IMF and these other um, global organizations have said, hey, you know, China needs to kind of continue to watch how they're spending in their infrastructure, because that's kind of going to get them into that debt place 
as they see today. But they're in kind of a, a hard spot because they still want to kind of continue to grow the economy, but they still need to kind of lay, lay back the debt. So, I mean, you kind of see that they traded, um, they came out in, in probably the first time in six years and decreased their trade deficit budget uh, in, in their estimates. And I think that is a sign that they're, they're, they're willing to be able to attack this problem that they, they potentially can see through the debt. And as China addresses its debt levels, how do you think that could potentially impact global markets? Oh, I mean, listen, China has been positioning itself with, you know, to be not just the main player in Asia, but in other places. No longer are they, you know, I don't think that they're looking to be, you know, side by side with the U.S. So, you know, everyone, they want to be the, the one full stop shop trading partner for many, many different partners. And that's what they've set themselves up to. So just lastly, as we look at where we are 10 years after the financial crisis, given the lessons that we learned, just how prepared is the global economy to withstand another potential major shock? Um, I don't know. I mean, with, with technology and with where we are 10 years ago to now, we are a different environment. We're a different economy. We are obviously, um, there's more, I would say, more problems imposed on different avenues and verticals in the financial markets and in different cultures and citizens. So, you know, I, I think we have a different nuance than we did 10 years ago. And I think now it's still to be very cautious, still to be very, these, again, these places to put in these controls are really, really important not to be able to come off that. All right. Well, thank you so much for your insights. Our guest there, Ryan Patel.